Right, so we're going to take a look at the cerebral cortex. We're going to start off by considering its fine structure. Then we're going to take a look um, at the idea of functional localization within the cortex before looking at each individual lobe and thinking about um, the individual functions of the various lobes of the brain. So you should recall that the cerebral cortex is a relatively thin layer of grey matter sitting on the superficial surface of the cerebral hemispheres. It's something like um, five or six millimetres thick, thinner in some places. Um, but don't let that fool you into thinking that um, it is simple or insignificant. This is the most sophisticated part of our central nervous systems. Now, I've got a couple of depictions of the cortex here. On the left hand side, we've got a diagrammatic representation of the inputs and outputs to the cortex. And in the middle, we've got um, a, a micrograph that was drawn by the famous Spanish neuroanatomist Ramón y Cajal, um, whereby we're looking at only about one in ten of the neurons within the cortex. So you can imagine if this figure in the centre of the of the slide was actually accurate in that every single neuron and its processes were labelled, this would pretty much be completely black. That's to give you some idea of the density of cells within the cortex. Now, as you should appreciate from our lectures on the sensory system, the majority of inputs to the cerebral cortex are either in blue from the thalamus that we can see here. So the thalamus we know provides a large number of inputs to the cortex. But furthermore, the second most important source of inputs to the cortex is actually from other parts of the cortex themselves. And in fact, this is a really important aspect of cortical function, that we have these recurrent feedback loops, if you like, where the cortex, cortex provides its own input. And if you like, that's the sort of neuroanatomical substrate of thought, where one thought that arises in the cortex leads to another, which stimulates further thoughts. So the cortex can stimulate itself by providing its own input. The majority of the outputs from the cerebral cortex are these red neurons, which are the pyramidal cells. These are large um, neurons which um, send long projections down to structures such as the brainstem, uh, basal ganglia and spinal cord. So essentially what we've got here is, is, is a... Um, reflex arc essentially where we have sensory information coming in and we have motor information going out. But this is no simple reflex arc because in between the input and the output there is a tremendous amount of complex information processing taking place. And this figure here at the bottom right um, is just a very simple diagrammatic representation of what might be going on. Um, it's taken from a paper, I think it was published by Google, where they were showing um, an algorithm that could recognize faces. And they were trying to use a neural network, an artificial neural network, to perform this task. And what you've got in a neural network, which is essentially like the brain, you have an input layer. Okay, And in this case, you could think of the input layer, each of these white dots, as one of, say, the photoreceptors within the retina. And then you have an output layer, which might be the letters in that person's name, for example. So this is a simple neural network that can recognize faces and report the name of the person. And the way it does it is by um, adjusting the strengths of the synapses at these so-called hidden layers. OK, so these hidden layers are where the real work is, go is taking place for this algorithm, whereby we are computing properties of the input layer, looking at these various people's faces to come to a decision about what their name is. And this process is taking place at this level here within the cerebral cortex between input and output. And believe you me, it is a lot more complex than what we see in this uh, neural network diagram in the bottom right. So that's the fine structure of the cerebral cortex, a structure which is only 
a few millimeters thick, um, is arranged in six layers, but is remarkably complex in its function and gives rise to a whole load of our uh, behaviors, thoughts, and emotions. Now, If, if you think about what we talked about just now, you might be forgiven for thinking that the cortex is uh, homogeneous, um, that it has the same six layers throughout, that, that they're the same thickness, and that the various regions do pretty much the same thing. However, um, we know that that is not true. <clears throat> and the first hint that this might be the case came from a group of people um, whose Conclusions have actually now been discredited, but who were kind of working along the right lines. And these were the phrenologists. And on the right hand side, we have an example of a phrenological model. Basically, what the phrenologists thought was that the size of various lumps and bumps on the surface of the head correlated with various personality traits and even correlated maybe with tendencies to criminality for example so for example um what we might what they might have said is if you have a lump here that corresponds with you being friendly for example and they turned it into an art form whereby they would fill people's heads measure the sizes of these protuberances and correlate that with their personality traits now this Pseudoscience has been discredited many times since its inception. However, we now know that in fact they were onto something. Because what has been found is that indeed the various regions of the cerebral cortex do indeed have different functional properties. And you've already studied that to a certain extent in head and neck. So you should recall about the uh, occipital lobe having some kind of visual function, memory may be in the temporal lobe, for example. This has been shown um, in brain lesion experiments, also in studies of patients who've had strokes. And furthermore, the neuroanatomical basis of it um, has been demonstrated quite convincingly by um, a guy called Corbinian Brodman, who was able to show that there are most definite histological differences between the different regions of the brain, and that's where these Brodman's areas came about. So the phrenologists were onto something, and if you like, they gave a certain amount of inspiration to people like Brodman, who came along and definitively demonstrated that the cortex um, does indeed have different functional regions. So let's take a look at these different functional regions. Um, and we're going to consider each major lobe in turn. Uh, now, before I start talking about the functions of the different lobes, I want to remind you that it can be a useful exercise for you to, to do a bit of reading and have a go at writing up your own case study um, illustrating a lesion in the lobe that we've been talking about. Um, and you can actually have a lot of fun trying to make up these clinical cases of patients with particular lobe dysfunction. Right, so let's start off with the frontal lobes. Of course, all the lobes of the brain are paired. There's a left one and a right one. The frontal lobes, remember, um, are sighted um, anterior to the um, central sulcus. So I'll just remind you that the frontal lobes are here, sitting anterior to the central sulcus. And the major function of the frontal lobes is that they are motor. They have motor function as their primary role. So for example, they contain the primary motor cortex here, which contains the motor homunculus, which has the cell bodies of upper motor neurons that activate the various muscle groups. But furthermore, the frontal lobes, specifically the left frontal lobe in most of us is important for the expression of speech. So um, Broca's area, which is the speech expression region, is found somewhere near here. All right. Um, and that is um, Im important for the motor aspect of speech for expression. Furthermore, they're important for behavioral 
regulation and, and judgment also. Um, this is particularly the prefrontal regions here. Now we know that from um, studies of people like Phineas Gage, for example. Um, many of you are probably aware of the story of Phineas Gage, but for those of you who aren't, Phineas Gage um, was an American who was working on um, uh, the railroad um, when, they, uh, when we were moving west in North America. And what Phineas Gage's job was, was to destroy large boulders that might be in the way of the railway track. And what he had was um, this large iron tamping rod. He drilled a hole in the rock, filled it with gunpowder, and then squashed the gunpowder down with this tamping rod. One day, a spark came off the rod, ignited the gunpowder, and shot the rod up um, under his zygomatic arch, through his frontal lobes, and out through the top of his head. Miraculously, he survived, but he was never the same again. Um, he became impulsive, he became um, an, a drinker, he became um, quite violent and struggled to hold down a job. So his behaviour was significantly altered, um, and he was really the archetypal case illustrating the normal function of the frontal lobes, and it's well worth reading up more about him. Interestingly, however, it seems to be the case um, that a number of aspects of Phineas Gage have actually become exaggerated due to the fact that people who write textbooks tend to refer to the previous edition of textbooks, and so a certain number of myths have crept into the story. Um, so it's well worth looking into that in a bit more detail. What else do the frontal lobes do? They're important for cognition, for our higher cognitive functions. Um, for example, uh, mathematical ability to a certain extent is cited within the frontal lobe, and certain frontal lobes te lobe tests ask patients to, for example, um, count backwards in sevens. Eye movements, there is a region of the frontal lobe known as the frontal eye field, uh, and this is very important for the regulation of eye movements. It projects down onto the brain stem um, and communicates with the various cranial nerve nuclei relevant to the eyes. And finally, the frontal lobes are very important in continence. There is a region up in the midline up here, um, known as the paracentral lobules, um, which has an important role in the regulation of micturition. Damage to this region, for example, as part of the global damage caused by Alzheimer's disease, can cause um, uh, urinary incontinence. So that's the frontal lobes. Let's take a look at the parietal lobes. We'll start off by just drawing them once again. The parietal lobes are sighted posterior to the central sulcus, and they're approximately in this region here. And whereas the frontal lobes have their major function uh, with regard to motor function, the parietal lobes are primarily sensory in their function. Um, this fits with that pattern that I've talked about before, where we have motor structures anteriorly and sensory structures posteriorly. So the parietal lobes are primarily sensory. They're important for the sensory aspect of language, of speech, and this is for the comprehension of speech. And usually the left parietal lobe contains an area that sits roughly here, known as Wernicke's area, and this is important for the comprehension of speech um, in the left parietal lobe. Furthermore, they're important for body image. Once again, this is a sensory function, and it's usually the right parietal lobe that is thought to contain our body image. And there are certain uh, lesions of the parietal lobe that can lead to certain interesting body dysmorphic disorders. Furthermore, the parietal lobes have a role in attention, specifically regarding the awareness of our external environment. Now, there's a very interesting condition um, called uh, neglect, whereby patients, despite the fact that they have normal visual fields, are actually not aware or rather don't acknowledge 
the existence of one half of their environment. And this can have some fascinating consequences, uh, which you'll look at in a little bit more detail when you study the stroke syndromes later on. The parietal lobe is important for uh, calculation as well as writing. And finally, even though this isn't a function of the parietal cortex, you still should be aware that the par parietal lobes also contain visual pathways. So the superior optic radiations pass through the parietal lobes on their way from the thalamus to the occipital lobe. So damage to the parietal lobe can cause visual impairments, even though the parietal lobes don't directly have a visual function themselves. So that's the parietal lobe. Now the temporal lobes. Now the temporal lobes are very, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. They sit here inferior to the sylvian fissure and being relatively posterior, they are sensory, primarily anyway, um, but they also have an important role in memory and emotion. Parietal lobes contain the primary auditory cortex, represented relatively superiorly in the temporal lobe. And they also contain the primary olfactory cortex, represented inferiorly. But furthermore, they have a strong role in memory. They have a very important role in memory. And there's a structure sitting deep in the temporal lobe that we can't actually see in this view, but it's called the hippocampus. And it is crucial for the consolidation, i.e. the laying down of new memories. Not all types of memory, but factual memories, for example. The hippocampus is very important for helping to lay those down. Furthermore, the, the uh, temporal lobe is important for emotional processing as well. And it's interesting to note that within that temporal lobe, we have both emotion, olfaction and memory all represented, um, sitting very close to one another. And it is often said that um, the sense of smell, the olfactory sense, is directly linked to the emotional centres. And, and that is true. They are linked within the temporal lobe. And we know that certain smells can indeed um, cause us to recall certain very strong emotions, maybe with very strongly associated memories. So the, the, the temporal lobes really are, are very important for our normal um, emotional function. Finally, and as is the case also for the parietal lobe, don't forget that the temporal lobe also contains visual fibres, third order visual fibres going from the lateral geniculate to the occipital lobe. So a temporal lobe lesion could feasibly cause a visual field defect. Now, how do we know what these lobes do? Well, we know what these lobes do because we've looked at patients who've suffered damage to them. Now, that might sound like a sensible approach. And in fact, it's pretty much the only approach that we have in humans. But there's a very important caveat that we need to be aware of. Uh, a psychologist called Richard Gregory um, drew a very interesting analogy between the brain and a radio. So here's, here's a radio, quite a posh looking radio. Um, and what you can imagine is that if I were to open up this radio and remove, say, a single capacitor or a single resistor from one of its circuit boards, it might start making a horrible howling sound. But we would not go ahead and conclude that the function of that resistor or capacitor was specifically to suppress howling. We would acknowledge that what we were left with was the residual function of the radio after having lost one of its important components. And that's how we should think about the function of these brain lobes. So in the case of Phineas Gage, for example, um, it may be uh, slightly naive to think that the entire function of the frontal lobe is in behavioural regulation. Actually, in the case of Phineas Gage, what we had was the residual function of his brain. His brain was working without a frontal lobe, which is a subtly different thing. Um, 
But if that doesn't make immediate sense to you, don't worry too much about it. It's just something I've thrown in here to make things um, a little more interesting and nuanced. Finally, you know, I've said that actually we've got a relatively limited understanding of the individual lobes and what they do. So really, what, what chance then do we have of working out how the whole thing works? Well, the truth of the matter is that this is a fiendishly complex organ, um, and it may be the case that we never get to the point where we fully understand how the brain works. However, there are certain diseases that can give us clues about the global functioning of the cerebral cortex. For example, Alzheimer's disease, which affects many, many widespread areas of the brain, has a particular clinical progression with particular clinical features. And so we may be able to learn quite a lot from studying Alzheimer's patients in terms of how the brain, lobes and other regions work together as a whole. So that's all I've got to say for this section. Thanks for listening.